So welcome everyone to today's Quantitative Biosciences um, Institute seminar at UCSF. It's really my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Daniel Wilson, who is uh, visiting us from Institute for uh, Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at University of Hamburg. Daniel is truly a thought leader and a trailblazer in mechanistic and structural studies on the ribosome. And it's really a tremendous pleasure for me to, to host him today virtually uh, at UCSF. As I've learned this morning, preparing introduction for Daniel, he is actually New Zealander, as you can see by his uh, Hobbit home. Um, and uh, he finished his PhD in Department of Biochemistry at Otago University in New Zealand. And uh, there, they, they have this really nice system of having external examiners. One of his was uh, Professor uh, Nierhaus from uh, uh, Max Planck Institute for Molecular Genetics in Berlin, which who then brought him to Europe. Uh, and after trying few jobs, Daniel really settled on structural biology and, and biochemistry, pursuing then his uh, postdoctoral uh, training as Alexander von Humboldt uh, um, uh, fellow at, uh, um, uh, at uh, Max Planck Institute, working on ribosome crystallography with uh, Paola Fuccini and Ada Jonat. Um, Daniel assumed his independent position uh, first at uh, LMU in Munich in 2007. And in uh, 2016, he moved to his uh, current uh, position as a professor of biochemistry in the Institute of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at University of Hamburg. Um, through his independent career, Daniel has made major contributions to understanding ribosome quality control, um, as well as mechanistic understanding of uh, mode of action of antibiotics and uh, um, antibiotic resistance mechanisms. He has uh, uh, pioneered uh, mechanistic and structural studies on uh, uh, many aspects of the ribosome structure and function, including near and dear to my heart, uh, uh, work on understanding context specificity of translation inhibition by, by antibiotics. In addition to his terrific uh, primary work, Dan Daniel is one of the uh, most inspiring writers of uh, um, uh, uh, perspectives and reviews and his uh, nature reviews in microbiology, I think 2014 um, uh, review on, on uh, um, uh, mechanism of action of ribosome targeting antibiotics has probably been cited in every paper of our labs written since 2014, at least in the ribosome area. So without further ado, it's really a tremendous pleasure and honor to have you today with us at UCSF. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us and uh, we look forward to your talk. For the audience, please put your questions into Q&A box and we'll read them at the end of the seminar. Perfect. Okay, so let me just see if that's working. Does that look okay? Yep, that looks great. Perfect. So thank you very much for a very kind introduction. <laughs> Probably too kind, I would say. <laughs> um, it's a really a pleasure to be able to zoom in to, um, to you guys there in San Francisco and uh, tell you a bit about our research. So if, as you've heard, um, we are focused on uh, the ribosome and, and protein synthesis. I'm not going to describe this, um, this translation cycle here. I think you will probably know it. Uh, but what I would like to emphasize is the fact that we're interested in the ways that uh, protein synthesis is regulated and, um, and how it responds to uh, different environmental stimuli, such as stress and how quality control systems are involved in, in dealing with those stress. Uh, in the past, we've done a lot with translational stalling and how the ribosome stores and how that can regulate antibiotic resistance genes or, or other um, regulatory pathways. In the last years, we've been, become interested in eukaryotic translation inhibitors. But today, I've decided to tell you a bit about our um, work, uh, which I would say is a major part of um, what the lab is interested in, and that is related to uh, antibiotics and resistance. That should go red, and it's not. I think maybe I've done something wrong. Uh -huh. Exactly, antibiotics and resistance. Um, and so 
maybe you're aware that the, the ribosome and, and protein synthesis is <coughs> represent one of the major targets for uh, antibiotics in the cell. And there's probably uh, an antibiotic that inhibits almost every step during this process, as you can see illustrated here. Um, and therefore, by studying antibiotics and how they inhibit translation, you can learn something not only about the antibiotics, but also about this fundamental process in the cell. And another reason, of course, that I'm sure you're all aware of is that we have uh, a, 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 a very large problem in the world at the moment. It's not just corona, but actually um, multi-drug resistant bacteria. So the, um, the numbers of multi-drug resistant bacteria are increasing with time dramatically. And this problem is compounded by the fact that the number of um, companies that are really um, researching antibiotics and also the number of new antibiotics that are entering into clinical practices has been diminishing over the years. And there was a review that I always uh, cite in that if this uh, trend continues, then by 2050, there should be more people dying from multi-drug resistant bacteria than cancer. And, and the, the numbers are astounding. So the prediction would be that one person would be dying uh, every three seconds. And so, of course, what we hope is that by understanding how antibiotics uh, work, maybe we can also facilitate eventually sort of a dream to design better and new antibiotics. And so over the past years, um, we've been looking at all different classes of, of antibiotics and trying to understand how they um, inhibit this uh, machinery. And obviously, I don't have time to tell you about all these different classes today. I think that the take home message here is reflected in my title. So David versus uh, Goliath. And that is the question of how a small compound such as chloramphenicol that's illustrated here can inhibit a monster machine like the ribosome. And of course, if you know your um, mythology, then uh, the David is slinging the, the stone at this monster Goliath and hitting, hitting the vulnerable part of um, of the machine. And that's exactly what uh, antibiotics do. And so this is just a, a summary, a superimposition of a number of crystal structures, no, by no means complete, uh, bound to the small ribosomal subunit. So if I just get this rotating here, and the sort of take home message here is that all these uh, off, lot of clinically important antibiotics are binding uh, on the small ribosomal subunit clustered in the functional sites here. And this is where the, the tRNAs and the messenger RNA bind. And so the, the take home message for antibiotics that bind to the small subunit is that they tend to uh, prevent the substrates binding. So preventing the tRNA or the messenger RNA from binding to the small subunit or preventing their movement through the ribosome during translocation. And on the large subunit, there's a uh, similar situation, maybe even more dramatic where almost all the antibiotics, particularly the clinically used ones, are clustered deep within the uh, large subunit here. And this is again the active site where peptide bonds are formed, the so-called peptidyl transferase center. So we're just rotating around here. We can strip away now the, the proteins and RNA. And what you see here is all these antibiotics clustered at uh, the site of peptide bond formation. So this is a P site tRNA, and then this brown polypeptide chain is um, a protein that's being um, synthesized. And you can see all the antibiotics are sitting clustered here. And so they are, uh, again, either preventing the binding of the tRNAs uh, to the peptidyl transferase center or uh, their movement in preventing peptide bonds from forming. And so, of course, <clears throat> I could spend hours going through all the different uh, antibiotics and explaining uh, how they all work, but instead I'm just going to focus on one topic today, one story about how antibiotics, or not really antibiotics, but how in, um, uh, peptides inhibit um, protein synthesis, and this is related to these uh, antimicrobial peptides here, since we've done a lot of work on these in the last years, and then at the end I would like to give you one story about um, a resistance mechanism to um, clinically important antibiotics. Okay, so first I'll tell you a little bit about um, antimicrobial peptides. So I think you've probably all heard of them. There's lots of different uh, flavors of these um, proteins shown here. Some of them um, perhaps more famous than others, human defensin, of course. <clears throat> That's um, 
part of the uh, innate immune system to respond to bacterial infections. And how do they do that? So generally antimicrobial peptides damage bacterial membranes and they can do this in many different ways, but ultimately by breaking open the bacteria, they're um, killing them. And of course, this is not really of interest to me. I'm more interested in, in ribosomes. And so you're probably wondering why I'm telling you anything about antimicrobial peptides. And the answer is because some years ago, I realized that there was um, a number of antimicrobial peptides that don't uh, damage membranes that actually get taken up by the bacteria and target intracellular processes. So some of them have side effects and damage the membrane a little bit, but the main target is actually uh, something inside the cell. And when I saw this translation, um, I immediately thought, ah, maybe this, uh, some of these peptides, some of these antimicrobial peptides that are actually targeting the ribosome. And so this is where it all began. And uh, the, the class that I'm going to tell you about are so-called proline-rich antimicrobial peptides. And uh, I'll show you a number of these here. You can see that they're predominantly from uh, uh, arthropods, so insects, and, and some mammals, uh, such as uh, bees and, and wasps and flies, beetles. And in terms of mammals, there's cows and pigs and goats, not, not humans so far, at least we haven't found any. And um, you can see that just looking at the sequences here that they contain a lot of prolines. That's why they're called proline-rich antimicrobial peptides, but also a lot of arginine. You can imagine positively charged arginines are maybe very good for interacting with um, negatively charged ribosomal RNA. So a few years ago, we also found that they are present in uh, dolphins. For those of you that like the um, bottlenose dolphin, there's also a uh, antimicrobial peptide that targets the ribosome present in these. And so how do they uh, do their job? And the answer is they were thought to interact with DNAK. In fact, they do interact with DNAK, but this was thought to be the inhibitory mechanism. So this is DNAK here. It's a chaperone found in bacteria that's involved in uh, folding of proteins. And these antimicrobial peptides can interact with uh, DNAK and were thought to somehow perturb their uh, function. And then there was a paper in uh, 2014 from the Hoffman Group, which I was then looking at and uh, was quite uh, astounded to see that um, you can take a E. coli strain where DNAK has been deleted and these antimicrobial peptides inhibit the strain equally effective as a strain that uh, does have DNAK, which suggests that maybe they do bind to DNAK, but this is maybe not so important for their mechanism of action. And in fact, if you look at the numbers here, you see that the, the MICs are actually better for the strain that doesn't have DNAK. And so in this paper, they also uh, tagged uh, antimicrobial peptides and fished out from E. coli lysates to see what they bound to. And what they found were ribosomes. Of course, that's why I'm telling you the story. And they measured some KDs and they uh, showed that they inhibit uh, translation using in vitro translation systems. And so this is where we came in. And uh, we were then interested to understand how these uh, antimicrobial peptides bind to ribosomes and uh, inhibit translation. And so I'm going to tell you about two. Um, I call them types of uh, antimicrobial peptides is type one, which is this large class here with all this conserved motif, this PRP, XP motif. And then I'll tell you a little bit about these um, other uh, classes of um, proline rich antimicrobial peptides. So our initial studies on these are already quite old, so I'm not gonna go into too much uh, detail of them, but basically, they all bind uh, to the ribosome in a, a very similar manner. So this is a cut through of the, of the, um, the bacterial ribosome. And you can see here the polypeptide exit tunnel. And in yellow here is one of these proline rich antimicrobial peptides it's sitting in the tunnel. And you can see a superimposition here of lots of different ones from uh, mammals, but also from insects. And you can see they all bind analog analogously 
within the ribosomal tunnel, there are some differences at, at either ends, there's some deviations in the sequence, but this conserved central core is binding to the ribosome in a very similar fashion. Um, so just to remind you, during uh, translation, the ribosomes initiate with an uh, initiated tRNA, so this FMET tRNA bound to the P site, and then they enter into the elongation cycle where tRNAs are delivered by this elongation factor TU. So first you decode the codon of the messenger RNA. If that's being checked, then EFTU leaves, it hydrolyzes, G hydrolyzes GTP to GDP, and this tRNA then accommodates at the A site. And so what we could show biochemically, I'm not gonna show you all the data, is that these uh, antimicrobial peptides, by binding within the tunnel, allow initiation to happen. So this uh, FMET tRNA can bind, but they prevent the accommodation of this A site tRNA. And you can understand structurally why that is, just by superimposing the A and P site tRNAs with these uh, antimicrobial peptides. So here's a mammalian one, this BAC7, and here's an uh, insect. Uh, and you can see they don't really overlap with the P site tRNA, so initiation can, can happen. But uh, when this peptide is here, you cannot accommodate an A site tRNA at the peptidyl transferase center. And therefore, you cannot uh, enter into the elongation cycle and cannot form uh, peptide bonds. And so, if we put these onto the um, onto the uh, translation cycle here, then you would suggest that these uh, proline-rich antimicrobial peptides, the type one, are preventing this final step here where the tRNA accommodates so that you can start to make peptide bonds. And so then this raised the question, do all the PRAMPs then have the same mechanism of action? And <clears throat> probably if you'd asked me um, before we had started these studies, I would have said, ah, they're all just going to bind in the tunnel and inhibit in the same um, manner. And of course I was wrong, otherwise uh, I wouldn't be carrying on with this um, story. And so what I'm gonna tell you about now is this uh, second class or second type of proline-rich antimicrobial peptides. And these are, um, in particular, I'm gonna focus on one, but I'll mention briefly at the end, this one here, this apodacins or the derivative of apodacin. So this is a synthetic version here that's been optimized for better MIC on bacteria based on the fact of binding to DNA K. So it's a funny optimization, but the MIC is, is better. So I guess it was actually optimized to bind better to the ribosome, and it does. And this peptides, these epidacins are from the, the honeybee, but also from some hornets and, and also from wasps. And then at the end, I'll just mention briefly this drosicin, which is from Drosophila melanogaster and another fruit flies. Okay, so this was a, a triangular collaboration with the group of Shuramankin in Chicago, and also Marina Rodnina in Gottingen. And this is uh, Tanya here, who I did one of the pioneering experiments. This is a, a toprint assay. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but this assay just monitors the position of ribosomes on a messenger RNA. And so this uh, onc here, this is oncosin. This is one of these type one Cramps that I told you about that allows initiation so the ribosome can bind to this AUG as initiated tRNA, but it cannot enter into the elongation cycle because this oncosin is blocking the, the tunnel and preventing the A site tRNA from binding. And so you use reverse transcription, you can see that we have a big uh, band here that tells you that the ribosome stuck on the initiation codon. And so when we and, and Tanya did these experiments with uh, apodacin, we were kind of surprised to see that actually the ribosomes can initiate without problems and they can actually translate the whole messenger RNA and they get stuck at the stop codon. And so I suddenly realized, well, okay, they have a completely different um, mechanism of action as uh, the ones I already told you about. And so the question is, okay, so how do they inhibit uh, translation termination? And so this was work, um, it was done by Christina in um, Marina Rod Nina's lab, and she used um, fluorescence or fluorescently labeled um, release factors to, to monitor the different steps of translation termination. I don't want to take too much time on this because this has already been published, but initially she uh, monitored um, 
a binding of the release factor to the ribosome. So basically there's a fluorescent dye here on the tRNA. And when the release factor, release factor comes in, it has a quencher here and you get a drop in uh, fluorescence. And you can see that if you do this experiment with or without, well, with or without uh, epidacin, it, it doesn't really make a difference, telling you that this uh, peptide doesn't block release factor binding. So then the next question, well, does it prevent the uh, peptide from being uh, hydrolyzed? And so this is then uh, an assay monitoring the release of this, uh, I think it's FMET from this uh, initiated tRNA uh, at a stop codon by a release factor. And you can see here that um, with uh, excess release factor, there is no effect of um, apodacin on this uh, hydrolysis reaction. So it's not preventing the release of the, the peptide. So what is it doing? And this is perhaps a little bit surprising for us initially, was that at, what it's actually doing is it's preventing the dissociation of the release factor after it's catalyzed release of the polypeptide chain. So this is shown here again with this quenching assay. Basically, um, the release factor binds, hydrolyzes the, the, the peptide bond, and then dissociates from the ribosome uh, in the absence of peptide. But when the peptide is present in the tunnel, then the release factor cannot dissociate. And so this was then when we came into the story to address the question of how does this peptide prevent uh, the release factor from dissociating. So this is work that was done by Mikhail Graf in my lab. And he used cryo microscopy to determine a structure of a ribosome that had translated the ORF and then got stuck by the peptide um, trapping the release factor on the ribosome. And this is exactly what you see here. This is a, a transverse section of the large subunit. You see that the, the peptide is binding again in the ribosomal tunnel as the type one um, cramps did. Uh, but this time it's actually catching the release factor. So this is RF1 being trapped on the ribosome because it can't dissociate because of this um, peptide. And there's a few surprising differences. So in, in uh, pink here, you see this um, apodacin peptide, and you can see it binds with a reverse orientation compared to these type one uh, peptides. So they have the C terminus down and the N terminus extending up the tunnel, so towards the peptidyl transfer center. So these are the ones that would block the A site tyranny coming in. And what you see here is that epidacin is bound the other way around with the N terminus down the tunnel and the C terminus at the peptidyl transfer center. And you can see it doesn't reach into the A site. So even though they have similar sequences, lots of prolines and arginines, they bind with a complete different orientation and they have a completely different mechanism of action. And this just shows you here that these peptides, they're binding effectively with the same orientation as a nascent polypeptide chain. So of course they're being synthesized with the N terminus extending out of the, the ribosomal tunnel. Okay, and so mechanistically, how does the peptide trap the release factor on the ribosome? And the answer is that there's one arginine that's found at the, the um, end of this peptide, arginine number 17, that's critical for this um, mechanism. So if you mutate this arginine to an alanine, these peptides are ineffective. And uh, the rationale for that is because they're not just interacting this little pocket here with the ribosomal RNA at the peptidyl transferase center, but they're also directly interacting with this glutamine, this conserved glutamine of the release factor. So in fact, this is actually part of this so-called GGQ motif that's critical for um, uh, coordinating water to, to hydrolyze um, the peptide bond. And so the other interaction that we see at the peptidyl transferase center is from the very end of the peptide. So this is a the synthetic version that has a hydroxyl group here. And this hydroxyl group could in principle make hydrogen bonds with the deacylated tRNA. Because as I told you, the, the state that is being trapped is post-release. So the peptide being released from this pTRNA and then the peptide is um, uh, interacting with the deacylated tRNA. So this is shown here in the model. So this is what we think is happening. The, the ribosome can translate the stop codon. The release factor recognizes the stop codon 
and hydrolyzes the, the polypeptide chain. Now this little window of opportunity here before the release factor can dissociate, this uh, epidacin peptide can then whiz along, probably not the best way it could whiz, it should really sort of whiz up the tunnel and uh, therefore bind and prevent the release factor from dissociating. So it has this little window of opportunity to jump onto the ribosome post-release. The nascent chain has to be released so that this um, peptide can go up the tunnel. Now that's not the end of the story because what you have to know is that the number of ribosomes in the cell is much uh, larger than the number of release factors. And in fact, it's 25 times more than RF2 and 200 times more than RF1. So that means there's lots of release factors, in the, uh, so lots of ribosomes in the cell, but very few release factors. So the mechanism I told you is actually only uh, relevant in the cell for a minority of the ribosomes. Only a small fraction of these ribosomes get trapped by the peptide because there's limiting amounts of release factor. So effectively what happens is that these peptides sequester the release factors onto these ribosomes. And actually the majority of ribosomes, they can translate and reach uh, the stop codon, but they can't release because there's no release factor left. It's all been sequestered into these epidacin stalled ribosomes. So we suggest two modes of interaction uh, or inhibition of these peptides. One is that the peptide stabilizes the release factor on the ribosome, and that would be the minority of ribosomes, whereas the, the majority uh, don't even have a release factor and therefore become stuck at uh, the termination codon, but with the polypeptide chain. And actually this can lead to misreading and read through and all sorts of other events, which um, I'm not gonna talk about. Okay, so <clears throat> where does this put uh, these uh, proline rich antimicrobial peptides on the scheme? And that is exactly here. So at the termination state, preventing the um, uh, dissociation of these release factors and preventing these ribosomes from being channeled back into uh, the translation cycle. Okay, so I wanted to just give you a little bit of outlook. So I've told you about uh, these type one peptides that all had the same mechanism to block acyte tRNA binding. I told you now about the second type, this epidacin. And so we're now looking at some of the other uh, peptides and I kind of wanted to present this in a bit more detail, but we're not quite there yet. But this, uh, we have now structures of, of drosicin. And the reason I became interested in drosicin is that the screen in here, the reason it's highlighted is because it becomes glycosylated. So actually the sugars that get attached here uh, are critical for the activity of this peptide. And uh, in the last uh, year or so, we've been working on uh, drosicin. And I just wanted to show you that the mechanism it seems to be similar to epidacin, so it traps release factors again at the stop codon. And recently we managed to determine a structure now of uh, this drosicin stalled ribosome. So here's drosicin again in the tunnel holding the release factor. It sounds very similar to epidacin, but actually the, the binding mode is, is quite different and we see where the sugar is and why it's important for its activity. And then the, the second outlook I just wanted to briefly mention is this um, BAC5 peptide. So BAC7 has this conserved PRP motif and binds very analogously to all these other PRAMPs that we've looked at previously. But one uh, BAC5 peptide, which is also from uh, cows and, and uh, goats and sheep and stuff is, um, is very similar in sequence. You can see it has lots of arginines and prolines here but it's actually impossible to align these sequences together. This PRP motif is not really here. There's lots of Ps and lots of Rs. And so we were sort of curious to understand, well, how does it uh, bind uh, to the ribosome? And so that's another thing that we've just managed to determine a structure now of this BAC5 uh, peptide on the ribosome here. Also binds in the ribosomal tunnel. And um, I'm not gonna go into details, but um, it basically, overlaps and binding site with, with BAC7. And actually the mechanism of action appears to be the same. So it prevents um, the A-site uh, tRNAs from accommodating, but the way it interacts with the ribosome is just completely different. Um, you can sort of see here's this uh, PRP motif here, and it's just not existing in this peptide. It's just binding in a completely different way. So it never so ceases to surprise me how 
peptides that may look similar, uh, resemble each other, but actually the binding mode on the ribosome is, is completely different. Okay, so with that, I would like to finish that part of the story and just acknowledge um, the people that were involved in this. So I start with um, uh, Apidacin. So I mentioned Mikhail Graf, who did all the electron microscopy uh, on that and actually all the toe printing um, from our side. And then uh, the biochemistry in terms of mutations and stuff, I didn't show you a lot of that. That was done by Fabian in the lab. Both of these uh, people have now left the group actually. And the work that I didn't go into too much detail, but the Drossesen structure is done by Tim, Tim Collar. He'll be at the ribosome meeting and um, we'll probably present that. And uh, Carolyn and Bertrand have been working on the, the back five story. And as I mentioned, the Epidacin was a collaboration with the Rodnina and uh, Mankin groups. And we work with Axel Innes and um, Marco Skoki in Trieste on some of these other pramps. Okay, so I think I'm good in time here. So the second part of my talk, I want to move uh, away from the focus of the compound, but onto the uh, resistance mechanism. And so this is the sort of subtitle of my talk here, the ABC of uh, antibiotic resistance. And so of course, ABC refers to ATP binding cassette proteins. And I think you've all heard of them and, and probably know a lot about them. They're ubiquitous, they're famous for, um, being transporters for importing and exporting things in and out of the cell. They have a um, conserved domain structure with two transmembrane um, domains then linked to these nucleotide binding domains. These can be uh, continu continuous, as so often in bacteria, or also come together as uh, dimers. And of course, these ABC proteins are uh, well known as uh, efflux pumps. So of course, this is one of the best ways for a bacteria to get resistance to an antibiotic. You don't have to make um, modifications in your highly conserved machinery, but simply just pump the, um, the antibiotic out of the cell. Now, what is perhaps interesting is that while many of these um, uh, classes of ABC proteins have transmembrane domains, there's actually a couple of uh, classes here, the E and F, that don't have transmembrane domains. And um, it was kind of interesting that for a while, even though they didn't have transmembrane domains, they were still thought, well, at least some of them were still thought to be involved in efflux. Maybe they recruit some membrane brown protein to um, efflux the antibiotic out of the cell. And so I just wanted to sort of take a, initially a little historical perspective and go back to the 1990s. I think one of the <coughs> um, experiments that still um, or led to the suggestion that even though they don't have transmembrane domains, they could still be involved in, in efflux. And so I'm sorry about the poor quality here, but I've just uh, taken this from the paper here that what you see here is DPM. So what we're looking at is the uptake of a radio labeled drug, erythromycin actually and it's been taken up into a bacteria. And um, this experiment is done uh, in, a, in a strain that doesn't have this ABCF protein. So in this case, it's called MSRA. And what you see is that over time, the antibiotic gets taken up by the cell and, and remains there. If you now overexpress this ABCF protein, what you see is that um, the antibiotic gets taken up, but then, gets removed from the cell. So suggesting that maybe there is a, an efflux mechanism working here. And this is uh, ATP dependent. So you can add arsenate, which depletes uh, ATP from the cell and uh, you lose this, this efflux. So that was probably the first evidence that maybe these uh, ABCFs, even though they lack the transmembrane domain, they could still be involved in, um, in efflux. And so what I'm going to try and tell you today is that uh, that's not the case. They're not involved in efflux at all. They're actually um, ribosome protection proteins. So they're proteins that, uh, this is the protein, that binds to the ribosome and prevents the drug from binding or dislodges it from the ribosome. And so to, to give um, some credit where it's due, this is the same group that published this uh, initial study that I showed you. 
And some years later, they did a, a, another experiment, which I find very nice and I think quite telling. Again, we're looking at the uptake of a radio labeled drug like erythromycin. And, uh, and you see it gets taken up into the cell. And if you now do the same experiment, but chase the radio labeled drug with uh, an unlabeled drug. So this is Virginia mycin S, which competes with the radio labeled drug. There's no efflux protein uh, involved here. Just simply the drug that is chasing the radio labeled one, presumably displacing it from the ribosome. And what do you see? Is you see efflux. So the, the drug is being removed from the cell, suggesting that maybe it's not all about efflux, but maybe just about removing the drug from the ribosome, which is like a sponge and soaking up all the drugs. And if you prevent the drugs from binding to the ribosome, then they can diffuse or be uh, extruded from the, the cell in some way. So that was indirect. And I think the first direct evidence was then some years later, quite some years later, or now at 2016. And this is work from the uh, Alex O'Neill group in Leeds. And um, there's two nice experiments I'd like to show you from, from this, uh, of this paper here. So the first one is a Staphylococcus aureus translation system. This is an in vitro translation system. So there's no membranes involved in this system. And this uh, translation system has been inhibited by an antibiotic, Virginia mycin M. That's why the activity is very low. And what uh, they show in this uh, paper is that you can titrate in one of these ABCF proteins. In this case, it's called BGAA because this protein gives resistance to Virginia mycin M. And as you titrate it in, you restore activity in the translation system. So this cannot be about efflux. It's more likely to be about dissociating the drug from, this, from the ribosome so that the ribosome can continue translating. And so then the second experiment uh, in this paper that I would like to show you is exactly showing that is now monitoring the binding of radiolabeled lincomycin to ribosomes. So this is normalized to 100%. You can chase this with cold lincomycin, and you can see you reduce the binding to the ribosome. You can try doing it with BSA, it doesn't work, but you can uh, remove the, uh, the radiolabeled lincomycin by adding in LSAA. So this is another ABCF protein that gives resistance to lincomycin and streptogermin. Uh, exactly. So this is then supporting the idea that these proteins restore translation by physically kicking the drug off the ribosome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so there's lots of these um, antibiotic resistance a ABCF proteins or ATPases, and this is just illustrated here in lots of um, pathogenic organisms, Staphylococcus, Listeria, Enterococcus, and they all fall into um, a series of families and they're classified in many different ways. And the way I like to classify them is simply by the antibiotics they give resistance to. So one family is this uh, MSR family here. It does resistance to macrolides and streptogramin Bs. So these are of course binding in the ribosomal tunnel. There's a, um, a growing family, which I'll tell you about later that confers resistance to oxazolidinones and phenicols. So one of the founding members is OPTRA. So it gives resistance to oxy, uh, oxazolidinones and uh, phenicols, and the TR means transmissible. And then perhaps the largest family uh, shown here is all these uh, different ABCF proteins that give resistance to streptogramins, the group A streptogramins pleuromutilines and lecosamides, such as lincomycin, which are all peptidyl transferase centers uh, binding antibiotics. Okay, so once we saw this, we were frantically trying to clone and uh, purify these proteins to make uh, complexes for structural analysis to try and understand how these proteins uh, dislodge the antibiotics um, from the ribosome and I have to say it was a disaster. For years, we really had nothing. And the only one that worked, and this is the one of course I tell you about, was, um, was this guy here, this BMLR um, protein from Bacillus subtilis. So this, this I will tell you about. So these proteins all have this uh, um, 
domain architecture, uh, architecture that I told you about was these two nucleotide um, binding domains. Uh, between these is a linker that is either called a key tRNA inter interacting motif or an antibiotic resistance domain. Uh, depending who you talk to, they have C term extensions, which I won't talk about, and this arm, which I also won't really tell you much about. And what I would like to draw your attention to is that the bottom of this tree here is a protein called ETA, ETTA, from E. coli. This is not an antibiotic resistance ABCF. This is an ABCF protein, but it doesn't confer resistance to antibiotics, but it has a similar domain architecture. And so this was the first uh, structure of one of these ABCFs uh, on the ribosome, I think. And uh, this was work done by uh, John Hunt and, and Joachim Frank. And you see here some uh, cryo electron microscopy reconstructions of this protein here in red. This is the ABCF with the two nucleotide binding domains bound to a 70S uh, ribosome. So this protein doesn't do resistance, but it's involved in some regulation, which we can talk about later if you're interested. Um, but of course, this was the precedent of how these ABCFs could bind to the ribosome. So this is ETA, it's bound in the E site of the ribosome, is the P site and the A site. We're looking at the large subunit here. And so the question is, if these other antibiotic resistance ABCF proteins bind analogously to ETA, then the question is, how do they kick off the drugs that are at the peptidyl transferase center here? Because the E site is separated from the peptidyl transferase center by tRNAs, presumably, which the antibiotics have, have stored. You'd have a pTRNA, maybe you'd have an ATRNA. And so that's what we wanted to, to um, address. And so after lots of cloning and failed experiments, we managed to get one uh, complex reconstituted from Bacillus subtilis, and the protein's called BMLR. And so this is all work. In fact, I think all the work I'm about to tell you for the next 20 minutes is. Um, done by Kalen here, Kalen uh, Crow McAuliffe. And so he managed to uh, get a bacillus translation system working where he could stall the ribosomes uh, with BMLR bound to them. And ultimately the trick that was necessary here is in addition to getting nice soluble protein was uh, he introduced these EQ um, mutations in the nucleotide binding domain. So it's an EQ2 mutation, because we have two of these mutations. They allow ATP binding, but prevent hydrolysis of ATP to ATP, and thereby trap the ABCF uh, on the ribosome. Okay, so then the question is, okay, great. So how is it uh, kicking the, the, the drug off the ribosome? So for that, we have here the, the P-site tRNA and the A-site tRNA in their canonical positions. This is where ETA binds, and it doesn't really disturb the, the P site TRNA at all, and it doesn't confer resistance to the antibiotics. But now, if you compare that with BMLR, what you see is that this uh, antibiotic resistance domain here, this linker here, is much longer, and it sort of just bashes its way past the P site TRNA, it causes the P site TRNA to be pulled out of the peptidyl transferase center so that this uh, little loop region here can insert into the, um, into the ANP sites. And so if we take another view here, this is sort of rotated back around, and now we make a transverse section so you can see the polypeptide exit tunnel here, and then the tip of this loop reaching right into the, the cytopeptide bond formation. This is where a P site and an A site TRNA would be bound, and this is exactly um, where VMLR the tip of this loop is positioned. And you can see here one a residue phi 237 that comes closest to the antibiotics that bind here. And I can just quickly show you these. Here's lincomycin, to which VMLR confers resistance, virginiamycin M, which also confers resistance, but not to virginiamycin S, which is, which is far, far away. It doesn't confer resistance to linozolide, nor to erythromycin. So we might come back to that later. It doesn't do resistance to chlorophenicol although it looks very close. And it does do resistance to humulene, so this pyrimutiline, which it's close to as well. So this is summarized here. These are, it does resistance to these three proteins. And you can see that it actually spherically overlaps with the binding site. So if you superimpose the antibiotics, I should maybe point out, we don't have an antibiotic in our structure. These are just a superimposition. And you can see that this phi 
residue at the tip of the ARD would clash with these. They're very modest clashes, but they're clashes nonetheless, and it gives resistance to these three uh, antibiotics. So what we did is we mutated the phi. First, we mutated to a valine because there are many um, of these proteins that have a valine at this position. And we thought that would remove this uh, steric clash. And we saw that, in fact, it still gives resistance to all three classes, a little bit less to Virginia mycin M. I don't really know why. And then we made this most dramatic mutation where we basically removed the, the whole phi for an alanine. And it's still full resistance to lincomycin and to timulin, but not at all to Virginia mycin M. Don't ask me why. And uh, what it doesn't do, as I mentioned, it doesn't do resistance to chloramphenicol or to linozoloid, uh, despite the fact that it would be predicted to overlap with these. So if you want to answer to that, we'll have to discuss that at the end of the talk. So we, at the moment, we focus on here. So if it's not sterically overlapping, but still providing resistance, how is it doing it? And so, of course, this is where you start to wave your hands and say, well, maybe it's inducing conformational rearrangements. And so I'm not saying we can prove this, but what I can show you is this is what a ribosome looks like when lincomycin is bound to it. So it has a sort of defined conformation of the, the A site uh, in which this drug binds. And when this uh, ABCF protein punches into the peptidyl transferase center, it causes rearrangements uh, in this binding site. And we suspect that it's not the, the steric overlap per se that's necessary for dislodging the drug, but actually disruption of the, of the binding site. And so to emphasize that a bit more, we have uh, subsequently determined structures of three more of these proteins um, that all confer resistance to the same set of antibiotics. One from Enterococcus vicalis, one from Listeria monocytogens, and one from Staphylococcus aureus. And the trick here in, um, is not to reconstitute the complexes uh, in vitro. We never managed to get purified protein, but rather we tagged these um, proteins in their respective organisms and pulled the protein from the cell and pulled the whole complex along with it. And again, we used these um, EQ2 mutations that was critical for getting this to work, but we're about basically able to pull out the whole ribosome complex with the protein and then analyze it by um, electron microscopy. And I have just re-emphasized that this is all, so I should say that the, the biochemistry was done collaboratively with a group of Vasily Haralik. So he um, uh, engineered these organisms and did the pullouts and then Kaylin in my lab uh, did structures of all these uh, complexes. And I have to say this was a formidable um, task because at the time there were not even ribosome structures of these uh, organisms. So he was actually, I would say he's pain-free that guy. He modeled uh, three, four, including bacillus, um, complete ribosomes um, basically by himself. Anyway, so let's uh, jump to the, um, the conclusion here. What is going on? You can see they're smashing the P-site DNA out of the way in the same way, reaching into the peptidyl transferase center. And so what is going on here? And this is shown um, uh, or summarized here that, uh, for example, LSA-A here has steric overlaps with all the drugs. This is reminiscent of the VMLR situation. But I think what is more interesting is to look at these uh, other organisms here. And you see, for example, VGA-A, LC, so this is from Staphylococcus. Uh, it has a valine here naturally, and it wouldn't be predicted to overlap. There might be a slight overlap with lincomycin, but I think the most dramatic one is uh, VGA-L here. And you see that it has alanine in the position. In fact, there's no uh, region of this protein that comes actually close to these drugs. And so I hope this will convince you that at least um, there's no steric overlap in these structures and that probably it's um, inducing conformational changes. And so, of course, now we go back and look at the, the ribosomal RNA, the lincomycin structures have these uh, defined conformation of the, of the ribosomal RNA nucleotides. And what we see is that whenever these ABCFs are present, there's all sorts of uh, rearrangements going on uh, in, the, in the peptidyl transferase center. I won't go into all the details. You can see that some of them are caused by stacking with the loops, but some are just indirect because the whole ribosomal RNA gets nudged 
by these factors. And there's no uh, conserved conformational change. They're all doing it in different ways. And I think you can just see that by flicking through them here. And this is maybe not so surprising because these uh, proteins are not related to each other. It's convergent evolution. All these uh, bacteria have evolved these proteins um, independently. So maybe you wouldn't expect to have a conserved mechanism. Okay, so um, what is then the, the take home message here is that uh, the ribosomes um, get stored by these antibiotics and the subset that I've been telling you about uh, are translation initiation inhibitors, which you have an initiating ribosome with a initiated tRNA here. And the stored ribosome is then recognized by these uh, ABCF proteins, such as VMLR, that binds to the ribosome, kicks the, the P site tRNA. Uh, out of the way, so it pushes the acceptor arm out of the way, actually rotates the whole tRNA out of the peptidyl transfer center to allow this antibiotic resistance uh, domain to reach right into the peptidyl transfer center. And this is meant to emphasize here that it's probably not a steric overlap that's critical, but inducing these conformational rearranges that leads to um, a reduction in the affinity of the drug, so it gets dissociated. And what I didn't tell you about is that we saw uh, subpopulations in our uh, structures that actually had um, A site tRNA bound to it. So we, even though you have a distorted P site tRNA, we sometimes saw an A site tRNA. And so we had this idea that, um, that when these proteins dissociate to prevent drug rebinding, this A site tRNA can reaccommodate with the initiated tRNA rather than everything getting dissociated and make a peptide bond. And if as soon as it's done that, you've moved from initiation into elongation. So these antibiotics are now not uh, effective against uh, these functional states. 48, good. Okay, so then with my remaining minutes, I want to just uh, switch from this class of uh, antibiotics to this class here. And so I told you about OPTRA, but in fact, since then there's been uh, Another world of these um, related ABCF proteins called POX-TA, and these two families confer resistance to chloramphenicols and uh, oxazolidinones. And these ones I find fascinating because unlike the ones that I've already told you about, where they have these big long loops here, so this is the, the linking region here between these helices, you can see that there's long uh, loops that reach into the peptidyl transfer center to dislodge the, the drug. And so that's fine. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have ETA, which you can see has a very short um, linker here, and it doesn't confer resistance. And so what you maybe see here is that OPTRA and some of these POX TA, they also very, very short in comparison with these uh, other ABCFs. And so of course the question is, well, if they're only a little bit longer than uh, ETA, how on earth did they get rid of the chloramphenicol and oxazolidinone compounds that are binding at the peptidyl transfer center? And so now we had this in vivo approach uh, working. And so again, Vasily Harulik uh, managed to get complexes. Again, we had to use these uh, EQ2 mutations to trap the um, protein uh, on the ribosome. And uh, we again used electron microscopy to visualize them. And this is what you see. We had lots of different states. Here's another A site tRNA state that I was mentioning before. This was our better resolved um, complexes. I think altogether we had the structure of this Enterococcus bicalis ribosome at around 2.4 angstroms. But uh, these substates were, were worse, I think around 2.9, if I remember correctly. What was very nicely resolved were the ARDs. You could see most of the side chains and this described interactions. We could see density for what uh, looked like, um, we don't know it's necessarily ATP, but at least um, trinucleotide phosphates. So the question is, how does uh, POTS-TA bind to the ribosome and get rid of chloramphenicol and um, and linozolate from the ribosome with such a short loop. So this is actually the structure or the model. And you can see that uh, it's far away from the drug. It's 16 angstroms from the drug and its binding site at the peptidyl transfer center. So quite unlike these uh, other 
ABCFs that have much longer linkers that reach right up towards the, the drug. Nevertheless, these proteins still induce conformational changes in the PSAT QNA. And this is shown here. So in gray is the canonical PSAT QNA position. And in blue here is the position in the POX-TA bound structure. And so what I just wanted to mention here is that normally the CCA ends when they're at the P site uh, are held in place by the P loop. So this is part of the ribosomal RNA that has these GG, the conserved GG, that can form Watson crit base pairs with the CCA end of the tRNA. Of course, this is how the ribosome facilitates some um, catalyzing peptide bond formation by grabbing the CCA ends of the, the tRNAs and putting them in place so that you can make this new nucleophilic attack. And what you see here is that when POX-TA binds, uh, it distorts the, the CCA end, end in a way that you actually get a register shift. So this C75 that would normally be base pairing with G2251 is now base pairing with 2252. And the C74 is shifted down. So everything is shifted down by about three and a half uh, angstroms. And so then the question is, okay, so binding of POX-TA distorts the, the CCA end of the P site QNA. So does that cause conformational changes that leads to release of the drug? And the answer is no. We don't want to go into the details here, but you can look at the conformation when chloramphenicol or, or linozolid are bound to the ribosome and it looks identical when POX-TA is bound. So it's not disturbing at all the binding site um, of, of chloramphenicol or linozolid. So how is it doing it? And so the answer, uh, well, to understand the answer, you need to understand how these uh, antibiotics work. And so I think this is um, a, a landmark uh, paper showing that often antibiotics are not just inhibiting every um, cycle during elongation, but they can have context specific um, effects. And so this is work from Shura Mankin's group showing that uh, chloramphenicol and, and linozide stall the ribosomes. This is using RiboSeq. We're not gonna go into the details of this, but ultimately the ribosomes that get most efficiently stalled are those that have an alanine uh, in the minus one position. So what does minus one position mean? That means that here's the PSAT QNA. This is the polypeptide chain. The zero amino acid is one that's directly attached to the, attached to the PSAT QNA. And the minus one is then, of course, moving towards the end terminus. And the plus one position would then be the A site uh, TRNA, A site amino acid that is coming into the, to the, um, the A site. And so then the question is okay, so chloramphenicol and linozolid stall in a context specific fashion. It likes to have an, an alanine in the minus one position. And so how does that work? And so there's uh, papers that you might be familiar with from the Fujimori and Fraser labs showing exactly how this works. And I think this is fascinating to see that this uh, alanine here in the minus one position, so here's the P site TRNA, zero minus one, is forming a direct interaction with the drug and stabilizing it in the A site. So this nice, CH pi uh, interaction is uh, critical for, for these dry drugs to bind stably. And this is why this conformation is favored um, for inhibiting um, the ribosome. And so now we come back to the resistance mechanism. And of course, this is a little bit rather crude modeling, but um, you could imagine that if the POX-TA is distorting this p site tRNA, and as I told you, it's, it's basically inducing a red register uh, shift pushing it out of the, or pulling it out of the, the peptidyl transferase center by around uh, three or four angstroms, that this is going to disrupt this um, interaction and reduce the affinity of, of linozolide. And there was also a, a, another uh, paper that was back to back in uh, MSMB from the uh, Yuri Polikhanov group in Chicago showing that it's a similar situation with chloramphenicol. This alanine again is critical for this CH pi interaction for stabilizing chloramphenicol on the ribosome. And therefore we think that this is how POX-TA uh, induces um, dissociation of the drug by changing the context.
so that brings me then to the, the model. So basically, um, linozolate and chloramphenicol preferentially stabilize uh, or store ribosomes when alanine moves into this minus one position so that you can have this interaction. These stalled ribosomes are recognized by this ABCF protein, POXPA or OPPRA, that binds in the E site. And as I told you, it has a relatively short linker. It doesn't pull the whole tRNA out of the peptal transferase center, but just shifts the register down so that we think that that would disrupt this interaction between the alanine and, and the drug. And that would lead to drug dissociation. Presumably ATP gets then hydrolyzed to ADP and this protein then dissociates. And um, what we saw, and I didn't really mention in too much detail, but we also saw uh, populations where we had the, the A-site uh, tRNA there with the amino acid, it couldn't accommodate, of course, um, when, a, when a drug is present, but once that drug has been removed, then this can fit into the A-site and you can immediately make a peptide bond and now you've shifted the register. Now the minus one position is no longer the uh, alanine and therefore the drug cannot rebind. And that makes the ribosomes uh, resistant to um, the drug until they meet the next um, alanine. And you'd have to go again through the, through the cycle. Okay, so with that, I think I've used up my time. I'd like to finish. And again, I have to acknowledge Kaylin who, um, it's just amazing. I and mean, he also did the POXDA structure as well. He's just uh, finished up in the lab and is moving to Patrick Kramer's lab. So he's moving from ribosomes to polymerases. And as I mentioned, uh, Vasily's group uh, was um, critical for getting this in vivo approach to work to get the complexes. And uh, Gemma, I didn't mention, she did a lot of the phylogenetics looking at um, the, the distribution of the different ABCF proteins. And yeah, there are other collaborators that um, were involved in biochemical aspects that I didn't mention. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Daniel. That's terrific talk. Fascinating to see diversity of ABCF proteins and mechanisms by which they are affecting uh, antibiotic binding site in the ribosome, whether that's through steric or allosteric or, or uh, context specific displacement of the drug. Uh, is there any information, and you mentioned that nature came up with this solution multiple times through convergent evolution, so fascinating. Is there any information either in that long arm or other segments of ABCF proteins that might inform in which of the classes they would fall or how they might, you know, what antibiotics they might impact? Good question, and I would say no. At least we haven't found it. So, I mean, initially we thought maybe the length would be a determinant, but actually there's many, what, and in fact, I didn't really um, highlight that. I can just quickly um, show you in the, in the talk here. So if we jump back to the alignment, that um, exactly. Uh, where's the alignment? Yeah. Can you see that? No, I think uh, uh, I'm not showing my screen. Sorry. Yeah. Um, exactly. So, I mean, part of the reason we chose some of these um, proteins was because they had very long um, linking regions. And so they're almost getting to the length of, of proteins that confer resistance to macrolides that reach even further down the tunnel. And so we were kind of running all what's going on there. And actually what, what we saw in the, in the structures um, was that, if you zip back a sec, was that these loops, they just end up sort of folding back this way rather than going down the tunnel. So length mm -hmm. is not a determinant. The sequences you cannot align. So I didn't mention that, but this alignment that I showed you here is actually not an alignment because you cannot align this region. We've just put them, uh, the sequences in here. Mm -hmm. um, the only really way to even tell if they're antibiotic resistance proteins is to, to do biochemistry, actually. Mm -hmm. um, some of them, you can't even tell if it's going to be a, a sort of a housekeeping ABCF or if it's an antibiotic resistance one. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot to do there. Fascinating. 
Uh, we have a couple of questions in question and answers. Uh, I'll start with one that continues on ABCF proteins and uh, it's from Brie Bibble who asks, do ABCFs get recruited to other stalled complexes as well? And how is um, the production regulated? Exactly. Does so, it depend on a drug being present? So I didn't mention that at all. And that's a, also a very important point. So these ABCFs, in fact, many of the, um, the resistance proteins are regulated by the presence of the drug. So they're often found in operons. We have an upstream open reading frame. And when the drug is present, that induces ribosome stalling that can, in different ways, through um, transcription attenuation or translation um, upregulation, excuse me, um, lead to expression of the downstream resistance determinant. And so, of course, it's actually interesting, and I think there's still lots to do there to actually understand, okay, which ORFs are upstream, which antibiotics are they sensitive to? Does that correlate with the, um, the resistance to which the downstream resistance determinants um, confer? And it's, it seems to be not always what you might expect. Um, but just to answer this, the, the first part of the question then, so what are they binding to? And I sort of alluded to that a little bit. I mean, this VMLR and, um, and these other uh, ABCFs that confer resistance to, to pleuromutilines and, and glencosamides and stuff, they don't do resistance to chloramphenicol and linozolide. Mm -hmm. um, but yet their binding sites overlap. And so the question is, okay, if the chloramphenicol blocks uh, a ribosome, it will also have a free E site, presumably. And so it should be a substrate for these ABCFs to bind, but of course, they're not gonna be upregulated because presumably the whole system is set up to only express that protein when the right antibiotic is, is stalling. So I think they could bind. The problem is, like I said, we have problems to set up in vitro systems. The proteins are not very soluble, um, but we know from, the, from doing this in vivo, if you express these proteins, they don't do resistance to chloramphenicol or linozolide. So they might try to bind in the E site, but they don't manage to kick the tRNA out of the way and, and get rid of the drug. And I suspect that is because um, maybe they're having a whole polypeptide chain is very different to having an initiated tRNA. So there's different classes of antibiotics that are doing different things, but that's a speculation. Thank you. We have time for one more question, and uh, I'll take one from Jack Tonton, um, who is asking, how long is the window of opportunity for apidacin to act? Is this window affected by mRNA or peptide context? For example, due to different uh, RF off rate. Exactly. So it's a good question. I didn't mention that. So uh, I, you might have noticed, but the structure is with RF1 and, and not RF2. And the reason is actually because it turns out that uh, RF2 is kind of quite good at just falling off the ribosome, so it has a much faster off rate. And actually, epidacin doesn't work so well against um, RF2. So the window of opportunity is favored towards RF1, which actually seems to require RF3 to be dissociated. And in fact, we actually had a sort of follow up study, which I didn't mention, where we used the fact that epidacin could trap RF1 to um, trap RF3 on the ribosome as, as well. Whereas that doesn't work with, with RF2 because it just sort of falls off. And so it's much, uh, the window of opportunity is too, too small for epidacin. But it doesn't really matter, right? Because I mean, the, the, the epidacin will then just bind to the next um, terminating ribosome and eventually it will capture all the release factors. Mm -hmm. Could be a nice system to, to look for new ribosome quality control mechanisms with all these ribosomes that don't have a release factor to... Assuming they have a GGQ motif, because it needs the Q. Sure. So if we've actually been trying this, putting the, um, the epidacin into bacterial lysates and things to try and fish out factors that might be involved in releasing um, these RQC substrates, but actually so far we haven't been very successful. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. That was a terrific seminar. We really enjoyed it. Thank you to the audience for joining us today. Um, uh, Daniel, I'll meet you at the other Zoom link in, in, in a couple oh, yeah. of minutes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.